we have an unbelievable speaker that we are about to um, enjoy and then be in conversation with, and she will be introduced by um, a, a colleague who uh, who hasn't been here that long. He has not been here long enough to shed his Florida skin and take on the much more hardier New England uh, skin. I, I, I hear there's some snow down your way, so I'm already feeling empathetic towards his uh, towards his situation. My good friend, Dr. Daryl Stark, who is the Associate Vice Provost for the Institute for Student Success. Um, he, he's, he's been dynamic since he has been here. Um, I can't, it's hard, it's hard to keep up with him, um, but he was good enough to uh, do the initial reach out to uh, Dr. Parnell for us because they've had some interaction before and he's gonna uh, follow me on here and, and introduce her into the, into the space. And so uh, Dr. Stark, you are, you're on the hook. All right, I haven't shed that Florida skin, but I have put on a Connecticut jacket, I'll tell you that. <laughs> so I, I had the, the pleasure of introducing Dr. Parnell. Um, so let me, I'll jump right into it. Uh, Dr. Parnell is the Vice President for Research and Policy at NASPA, Student Affairs Administrators in Higher Ed, where she leads many of the association's scholarly and advocacy-focused activities. Uh, Amelia's policy and practitioner experiences include prior roles in association management, legislative policy analysis, internal audit, and trio programs. Uh, she writes and speaks frequently about topics related to student affairs, college affordability, student learning outcomes, leadership in higher ed, and institutions' use of data and analytics. And for us, some of us data nerds, that is big. Um, She's the author of a new book that you can purchase. You are a data purchase person, St strategies for using analytics on campus. And she also hosts a new podcast, Speaking of College, which actually comes from both, uh, you know, an administrative focus and as good work uh, for students. Amelia currently serves on the board of directors for EDUCAUSE and is an advisor to several other higher ed organizations. She holds a PhD in higher education from Florida State University, where I think some, some great people came from. <clears throat> she also has a master's and bachelor's degree in business administration from Florida A&M. Go Rattlers, where my wife is also from. Um, personally, um, you know, this, we're here talking about cultivating LTE, and I think uh, she fully embodies the ideals of what we talk about. I met Dr. Par Parnell when I was still in the process of my doctoral st studies, and I was actually at a point of, of being about to accept ABD. Um, and I met her, and her encouragement and advice helped me to kind of refocus, to trust my support system, and to get, get it done. Um, it gave me that added push that I needed to finish. Um, it didn't hurt that as a member of the FSU Higher Ed LifeNet, she knew exactly who I was working with and could speak to her experiences going through the same program and walking in similar shoes. Um, so I know I did it, you know, virtually and digitally, but I definitely wanted to thank you again for that encouragement to help me realize my higher ed goals. So I, I, I knew there would you would be a perfect speaker for today. So um, with that, I want to introduce to some and present to others Dr. Amelia Parnell. Oh, you know, this is the one time that I would say, you know, the one downside of being together virtually, but picture like a virtual, like a high five, like a, this is, this is so cool. Um, so first off, let me just start with some thank yous. I have some slides, of course, I, I want to present, uh, but I got to start with some thank yous. So first things first, um, Dr. Stark to Daryl, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, I, as you would imagine, when you get an email from someone who says, hey, we're having an event, we would love for you to come or you know, present with us. Typically, they start by just listing out all the things about the program. Here's our theme, here's our goals and things like that. Um, but the invitations that, that really speak to me and that I get most excited about is when they frame it as though it's gonna be a conversation. Because one of my favorite things to do is the question and answer. And honestly, I'm going to give you all, what will feel like a buffet of information. A lot of different details, some resources here, some data points there, new framework here. Um, but you can only fit so much into 50 minutes or so. And at some point, I'm the person at the end of the reception who's like, hey, you want to keep in touch? You think maybe we could swap business cards? And so the email that came from you to Daryl really felt like, would you like to join us in this conversation about life transformative education and share some of the things that you know and talk with us as opposed to present to us? And so 
I've been excited. I cannot say that I've done uh, a keynote that was preceded by yoga. And so the, I think the stage has been set. I feel very comfortable. Not that I didn't already, but it's just good. So uh, thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you, uh, Michael. You know, I think you were the first to follow up and say, hey, would you please consider, you know, would you really have any time in your schedule to join us? And so the warm welcome just overflowing it makes me feel very, very good. I have to echo Michael and say thank you, Misha. Uh, congrats on your first uh, week or two. You know, you jumped right in and uh, I wouldn't have known otherwise if you hadn't mentioned it. So um, very thorough. We swapped cell phone numbers. We've emailed back and forth. You've made it very easy for me. So just want to publicly say thank you for uh, doing so much to make this an easy process. And thank all of you all for coming. I got the email. I don't know if I was supposed to get it that said the campus was closed and that people would not be on campus. I was like, I'm reading the fine print. Like, does that mean the LTE conference is still going? Of course. So the fact that you all would be at home in the middle of bad weather and still choose to do this and come and listen to this talk means a lot to me. So like I said, I have a lot to share. Um, I naturally speak quicker with a faster pace. I'll try to keep it at a pace so as to contain my excitement. Um, and I'll go ahead and do something that I typically forget to do um, before the end of the whole uh, spill and just put my email address right here at the end because normally I forget to skip to the last slide. And so if anything I say resonates with you, uh, excites you, you want to talk more about it, I really do answer all my emails, maybe not on the same day, but within 24, 48 hours. So if you want to have a link to a report that I've shared or a connection someplace or other, I enjoy doing that kind of stuff. So let me start by sharing my screen. I have co-host privileges, which means I could do breakout groups and all that stuff, but that's not what I'm going to do now. Okay. Uh, I can see you, Michael, on my screen. And to Daryl, could either of you just give me a thumbs up or something if you can see? Okay, good. So you see my title. Three strategies for connecting LTE to student success. And so I tried to play a literal uh, play on words with the connection. I started to put a computer and make it be Wi-Fi connection, but I felt it was too soon for jokes about that. And so I thought maybe a connection to light bulbs, all plugging into the same place, all going in a different place. Um, light bulbs meaning something that would be really cool to brighten up our, our day and illuminate the things that we can talk about from going really literal. Also, I just happened to get these Philips Hughes light bulbs two days ago. I'm late to the game, but I didn't know that you could control the lights with your phone and all that kind of stuff. So I was in a a room lighting type of mood when I, when I started this uh, this theme here. So here's the run of show. Uh, I'm going to start and tell you a couple more things about myself that really just frame how I see higher education, uh, things that influence how I talk about higher education and what motivates me. Um, and then I'll tell you a tiny bit about NASPA since that's where I work, not too much. Um, and then I'll go into what I see as a category of what's going on. What's, what's currently happening in higher education that I think undergirds this conversation about life transformation, uh, life transformative education um, and student success together. Big questions that I think we probably won't have the answers to immediately, but that just seem to be around us. And so that's really just to set the stage. Then I'll go into what I think are the specific three strategies. Uh, spoiler alert, they'll be easy to, to follow, but filled with a lot of resources. From there, I'll give you a couple additional priorities that I think we should remember. And throughout the whole thing will be links to resources, reports, and things I think would be just good to follow. And so from there, I think we should be close to the top of the hour or a little bit before that, and I'll stop sharing the screen and go with some questions. So if you're one of those people, as you're listening, watching, just something resonates with you, feel free to use the chat. I might not catch it likely during the, the slides, but right after that, I'll do some scrolling and we can pick up from there. So that's it. Let me jump into about Amelia. I like this slide because sometimes when you're listening to the, the bio that I wrote with all the details about where I went to school and what I'm studying and where I worked, it doesn't tell you quite as much about who I am. And it's not to spend too much time making it about me, but I do think that when you hear a speaker, you want to know, like, what's their vantage point? How, how are they coming to these conclusions? And so at the core, I'm an optimist. Uh, and I'm going to share some, some data and stats and points that make us scratch our heads and make us need to have yoga to calm down and think about how we can process all of this. But at the core, typically, I still remain optimistic that college is worth the investment, that our biggest, biggest problems we can solve together. And so that doesn't give me a certain naivety, but it does make me continue to want to come back to work. And so I, I think I've had that personality since I was young. So the upper left picture is a picture of me and my twin sister, Amanda. And that is me trying to pick up the goat. And uh, the story, as my mom likes to tell it, is that uh, she doesn't know what I was going to do with the goat at the zoo. Had I been able to leave with it, of course, I was not able to. But my general personality is that I'm not afraid to try new things. I'm optimistic that things can work out in a variety of ways. 
upper right is a picture resembling a farm. So it's not the farm that I grew up on uh, exactly, but I am from rural Lake City, Florida. as North Florida, about halfway between Tallahassee and Jacksonville, Florida. And so growing up on a farm taught me a lot of things, but one of them that stands out with me is the, uh, the idea of sharing. And so every year we have different cycles of crops, corn, tomatoes, snap peas, watermelons, cucumber squash, all that stuff. And we would always have more than we needed. And so we would always share with neighbors and neighbors would share with us. And so when I'm doing a, a keynote or any type of engagement with anybody, as to Daryl mentioned, I don't mind sharing. If I know something, know somebody, can share something, I'm happy to do it. I'm definitely a connector. Uh, the bottom left is to show that uh, you know, change during the pandemic has happened. Okay, as you can see, I have short hair. I went through a phase when I thought I was going to try to cut my own hair. And then I realized why those who have a license to do hair have said license. And so it didn't go well. But it's a reminder <laughs> that on the other side of my optimism is a little bit of reality. And it did work out. And that is not the picture of what happened when I cut it. But it's just a little reminder that, you know, we all evolve and we go through transition more on transitions later in my talk. And then the bottom right is kind of a little bit more of the why. So uh, when I was uh, in high school, my sister and I, we were uh, about to go to Florida a &M, and my parents didn't go to college and we didn't know about the FAFSA. Our cousin was the director of financial aid at the local community college and came over and helped us complete the whole FAFSA. And that was when it was paper and it was a whole lot more cumbersome than it even is now. Um, how, how so, you might ask, I'm not sure, because it's still pretty cumbersome. Uh, but at the time I remember thinking we would not have known anything about how to do this. And as I look still now in 2022, there are a lot of students who still don't have easy access to all of us. They're not at the LCE conference. And what would they have as a resource to be able to get reliable answers to college-related questions? So I created the podcast. And so on the podcast, I talk about everyday topics. I don't even say higher education. I say college. And we talk about what faculty do when they're not in the classroom. We talk about how to pay for college and things like that. So it's not really a podcast for us. A lot of the things we probably already know. But if you happen to think about the average person who doesn't have access to us, that's why I created the show. All right, so a little bit about NASPA, really briefly. Like most other membership associations, NASPA has a specific focus. Ours is student affairs, student life, student services. And for many, many years, uh, we have gathered together, you know, for in-person conferences, we've done virtual things, but the goal is to highlight the importance of student services and those connecting to work that we would call student success. And so happy to work there, been there almost seven years. It gives me a chance to really broaden my network and we can talk more about the issues of student affairs another day. Today, we're talking about other things. And so I want to start here with what's going on. And I change these questions every few months because it seems like there's always something going on. But right now, I would say there are several leading questions about higher education. I think some of these might resonate with you. And so if we're thinking about big questions about higher education in the next two to three years, here are the ones that stand out. Now, I could have easily added two or three more slides, but that, that would depress us a little too much. But here's the things that I continue to see. How stable will institutions be financially? Now, this varies a little bit. Depends on if you're at a, a rural institution, maybe a community college, large, small sector, public, private. I realize there's a lot of nuance here, but the question about financial stability is still one that we're wrestling with. And I see campuses come at it from a lot of different perspectives. Should we keep tuition uh, rates flat? Should we pursue outside giving? Um, should we change our enrollment management strategy? There's a lot going on, but it all comes down to us being able to be financially stable. And then of course, also having something there for our growth in the, in the future, because we're gonna need to evolve. Next, how will institutions balance free speech and safety? And you think, okay, that's a, maybe a sub-issue, but it's, it's, it's still there. It's still bubbling up. The idea that students will want to have a space to advocate on behalf of the issues that they care about, they'll also want their institution to support them. And so I got some, uh, some resources later on to talk about that and the movement toward it. Third, COVID-19. You ask anybody about how the last few years has been going, it could be on a campus or not, but someone's going to be talking about the impact of the pandemic. One thing that I think will stay with us for the next couple of years, we'll continue to focus on how we shift our residential and virtual campus operations. I think we got a good example of it today. We're all joined virtually. I think every campus just about has talked about uh, the list of things that they want to continue to have a virtual aspect to, the list of things that will still probably be primarily on campus, and the blend between those two, how you leverage technology, how you do a lot of things. Next, how will professionals adjust their measurement and reporting of student performance. Now, this is a big one because I, I get the question, I'm, I, I'm one of those people who just loves data conversations too, but the question I get a lot is, what do we do with the two years of the pandemic? So if we're reporting on outcomes in a particular course or a program or an initiative, uh, do we put a little asterisk next to the pandemic years? Can we really compare that? Are these two points going to throw off the trend? It's going to be like an explain away type thing. I would say we need to keep those data points, but as we're talking about how we're going to 
proceed in the future about measuring and reporting on students' performance. It could be their learning outcomes. It could be their engagement activities, things like that. We'll still have to wrestle with that. And if that's not enough, I would say we still are going to have to have some new talking points about the debate regarding the value of a college experience. Now, I've bought in. I, 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 can, I cannot be convinced otherwise that college is not still worth it. But I do value the question of tell me why it matters, show me why it matters, and especially given the large investment of time and resources um, that students are making and professionals who help them, we do need new talking points. So if this were the first of a commercial break, I would say here's a good report, free from the Gates Foundation. If you go to postsecondaryvalue.org, it's about a hundred page report. And in it is a lot of detail, uh, frameworks, definitions of value, and action agenda. Basically, not to say these are the new talking points about the value of higher education, but if you're wondering where you should start a conversation, if you're wondering where policy and practice uh, intersect with a little bit of research as well, this is a really great report. And so the idea is that this, this title, Promoting Economic Mobility and Social Justice Through Post-Secondary Education, I think many would say those are two valuable parts of a college experience, and this report talks about it from a variety of different angles. And so it's right there. Uh, they, there was a convening of the Post-Secondary Value Commission, and this is the, the product of their work. And so I think you might find it really interesting. All right, so let's get into the three strategies. I've come up with three. They're easy to understand. Imagine this being uh, us taking off. We're about to get on the plane, go somewhere uh, to have a good time. And I would say we're probably going to the LTE conference. And so with this first one, think of it as taking off, getting toward our cruising altitude. I think the first key is to set clear goals for student success. You probably saw that one coming. Got to have a why. I think even browsing the website for the LTE um, that you all have, it was obvious to me that's a clear and transparent goal that you're trying to pursue. The second is if we're going to make this student centered, I want to kind of double down a little bit on the, the topic of transitions. The idea that at any given time, we as individuals, students, professionals who are serving them, we're going through things. We're in flux. You know, there's no finite point in time in which we would say, we've done it. We've reached the point of success. Let's move on to the next student because success on Monday might look very different and success the following Tuesday. And then lastly, putting it into action. I, I couldn't help but sprinkle in some of my perspective with regard to using data, which I think will be an evergreen skill set that we're going to need now and beyond. And so specifically, I'm, I'm encouraging us to assess needs and processes in addition to outcomes. And so I'll make it practical with a really cheesy analogy about my green thumb or lack of that when it comes to growing plants. And then I'll lead into a couple excerpts from the book that I just released. So going from there, Setting clear goals for student success. And I put the, the Scrabble letters making the word plan. Side note, I just got into Wordle. I'm, I'm late to the game, but I found Wordle. and I, I do okay with it. But um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I'm convinced that it is, it's harder every time I play it. When you ask somebody about student success, I find that it's everywhere. And so if, if I meet a, a campus professional who says we are committed to student success, it usually shows up in one of these five areas. It's a position, there's a student success coach, there's a director of student success. You see it in programs like campus-wide student success initiatives or a summit or a particular program. You see it in departments like an office of student success or a center that, that's centered around that. Uh, metrics, of course, are goals, objectives, indicators, and tying all that together is probably a mission, a strategic dedication, a commitment to student success. And so I don't think that's really challenging. I think that we've had that in place for a while, even before we tried to put it into these type of categories. But typically when I talk with somebody and I say, well, tell me what you mean by student success. How do you define it? I see these common three indicators a lot. It's going to be retention, persistence, graduation. Yes, somebody, how do you know a student at UConn is successful? They'll say, well, our graduation rate is this, and they persist in the major about this much time. And they they usually engage in this many clubs or activities, or they have this many um, hours of service. And that's good. We need measurable outcomes. We need these types of things. And our, credit, our creditors require it. Uh, for any reporting, I think we have to let people know this, that that is the, the goal for us to reach these outcomes, milestones. But I kind of want to go a little bit different. So a couple of years ago, someone asked me if I would write a blog post, given working at NASPA, how I would define student success. And it tripped me up too. <laughs> I started off with the first paragraph that said, well, we want students to graduate on time. I was like, oh my goodness, you, you, you are doing the very thing that you're trying to challenge. And so I came up with this idea that if we were going to expand our definition of student success, we should specifically talk about what a student knows how to do and how they can do that as a result of a college experience. And so these are just three. And I would encourage anybody who's having this conversation about what a transformative experience would be to build on these, uh, make these your own. And so the things that I came up with um, were that a student would understand how to balance competing individual and community priorities. And so this is, I mean, for lack of a better word, group work versus individual work. And that work could be to deliver a program, it could be deliver a service, it could be anything really. Um, but putting a student in a campus environment in which they understand what they need to thrive, as well as what their contributions to the group's 
thriving would be is essential. It's hard to measure it, it's hard to capture it, but you know it when you're starting to develop it because you ask different types of questions. Second, knowing how to manage resources for which you have individual responsibility and share responsibility. So I talk a lot with vice presidents for student affairs and they say that a skill set that is essential once you get into the field is budgeting and supervision, knowing how to allocate resources if you're the director of something or assistant director of something. And how do you do a shared budget planning process? And so it's not exclusively money. It could be allocating personnel. It could be investing in technology. But the idea that as a college student, you're, you're still going to be doing a lot of those things. And those are skill sets that are still evergreen. And to do that makes you really successful. And then lastly, it's kind of like their own why. Realizing what your own unique contributions will be to the world and how can you leverage those skills and abilities to make things around you better. Improve conditions of things. And so I think that a successful student, these three things will happen and they will continue to persist toward a credential and experience really great clubs and activities and have sense of self and awareness and things like that. So I, I use this as a way to nudge us and say that as we continue to, to use the blanket term student success, let's be more descriptive about what we mean when we're, when we're doing that. So I did some digging online and I said, well, there are probably some things about uh, LTE that UConn has put out there publicly. And so I found this and uh, you know, give you credit there. Um, it, there's some statements on here that I like, especially though. It said there are two areas of a life transformative educational culture that will touch and inspire everyone at UConn. It says faculty and staff feel these two areas are fundamentally valued and an intrinsic part of the why of UConn. I like these two things, developing authentic and supportive relationships with students and extending the opportunity for all undergraduate students to participate in learning experiences that develop agency and purpose. And so as I thought about that, I was like, well, if this is the goal, and this is kind of what centers all faculty and staff, and this is, this is key to the why, what should we be thinking about in order for this to work really well? What can I offer with you as a perspective? And so that led me into my thinking about one of my favorite types of discussions, which is around theory and student development theory. And so I'm going a little bit, just think of the buffet. So we're in the section of the buffet where we're going a little bit into uh, developmental stuff, but I'm going to tie it back to something more practical. So in this case, strategy number two. So if the first one was setting clear goals, the second one I would say is to acknowledge and consider students' transitions. And what I mean by that is Schlossberg, for example, specifically. So uh, those of you might remember that from student development theory. I, I like this one a lot. It's a framework uh, that I tried to capture in a picture to the left. And I don't know cars that well, but I tried to do a Google search for timing belt or engine or something like that to describe that basically under the hood of any automobile, there are a lot of things happening in silos, but that have to work together. And the transition between gears, even if you drive a manual um, vehicle, you have to shift between second gear, third gear. If you're not doing it manually, the car does it automatically. It speeds up when it needs to when you hit the gas pedal, things like that. In order for that type of synergy and connection to happen, the transitions in between, if something is not quite what you expected, if the gas, uh, the, the tank end up having a small leak in it, or if one of your tires has a small leak in it, or perhaps maybe your air conditioner goes out. A lot of these things can impact the overall functioning of the vehicle. Similarly, I would say that in this case, if you're thinking about transitions for students, this framework is used to talk about how to cope with the ordinary and extraordinary process of living. Some things are expected, some things not expected. So you would think of an event or a non-event, something that you wanted to happen that did happen, something that you wanted to happen that didn't happen, something in between. And so the idea is that you have these anticipated events, the unanticipated, and then the non-events, something that just didn't happen even though you expected it wouldn't. And you think, well, what's the big deal? How does this all relate to students? I think it's very, very integral for us to keep this in mind because again, as students are trying to navigate their way and have a transformative life experience in college, uh, at the same time, lots of these events are going on at the same time. And so the transition theory is talking about four key elements. So naturally, the situation which would be your ability to control things, how you're going to be managing any concurrent stress that's going on, support, which would be your networks, it could be your peers, like it could be their parents, it could be their roommates, it could be their uh, friends on a project, self, so personal characteristics, your outlook, your values, things you hold dear in life, and then strategies, basically, how are you going to control the meaning of what's going on? So if you think about that as a foundation, now we have something to work with to say that if every UConn student is supposed to go through this experience and they're supposed to, on the other side of that, have something that enriches them and helps them integrate and connect their learning across everywhere. How do we capture that? How do we show that it happens? So I have a really great example for you. 
And I don't know if you have heard of these, but uh, comprehensive learning records, and they, they really encompass quite a bit. So in student services, some might call this the co-curricular transcript. That's a good start to it. Um, some might refer to them as digital badges. That's a good start to it as well. One of my favorites is the e-portfolio. Um, but the, the, the idea, the concept behind it, though, is that you have something that's digital. It's easily transferable. Students can add to it. Faculty can review it. Uh, professionals can add to it from a perspective of growth and development. And it encourages the student to use every juncture, major juncture in their college experience to curate and narrate their journey. So even though a transition might happen, maybe they thought they were going to major in biology, got into it for the first semester, realized biology is not for them, switched their major to history. Once they get into the history major, they may have written a really great report where they've dug into a particular topic and it illuminated their fascination with a particular period in history, and they're able to capture that and put it in a record. I think that captures a lot of what the spirit of transitions being something that pushes a student into growth and development. So there are a lot of campuses that are now moving in this direction. Um, ACRA, which is the Registrar and Admissions Officers Association, NASP, of course, and then the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment. We've worked with over 100 institutions to help them create a version of their own comprehensive learning record. So if any of this resonates with you, you seem uh, eager to learn more, just drop me a note. I can give you some really great examples of a lot of campuses of different sectors and sizes and types that have tried to make this work. And here's the takeaway um, from the report. So the, the first time around we did this, we've done it in two phases. Um, Tom Green and I put together a report, and this is one of the things that I think we would say we highlight most. The success of institutions in this type of project doing this, it demonstrates an increased awareness that learning occurs in many ways, locations, and times. I think you all know that and would agree. And that the intentionality around that learning is increased when faculty are involved in a process to review the learning outcomes within a course, program, degree, student experience, or other learning mechanism. I encourage us to think about the goal of that, measuring learning wherever it happens, inside the classroom, outside the classroom, capturing it, displaying it clearly, helping the student tell their own story, but being aware that as they do so, they're still going through life. You know, life transformation happens in a period of stages, phases, transitions, and to the extent that we can remember that, I think will make it a much more holistic and thoughtful experience for them. All right, before we move on to number three, I want to just drop this in here, just as a, a frame of reference. I think a lot of this is probably like, yeah, Millie, we knew a lot of this, but a couple of things I, I want to highlight. So as I think about integrated learning, um, I see six key considerations. Obviously, the connections, where are students going to be meeting people? You know that already. Individuals, small cohorts, large group. Uh, learning, what types of things do we want to put in a, a comprehensive learning record or have a student say that they can do? Problem solving, communication, all the things that whether you're looking at NACE competencies or you're looking at your own institutional learning outcomes, they would be in there. Duration, obviously, one-time things, one-day things, year-long things, spring break things, doesn't really matter, but the idea that duration matters is probably um, the key piece there. Data methods. I would love to highlight this one as one for us to come back to uh, in the next strategy because many will continue to ask this question of what is the impact of the more engaged and connected student on their overall persistence toward a degree? I think we're doing a better job of explaining that, but I think we still have to do more. I think we need, we need a variety of data sources and methods to capture. Um, last two experiences, I put in the experiences category on campus employment. I know there's been a bit of an ebb and flow in terms of conversations about that, but I'd encourage us to go back and look at that again, specifically because I think it pressures us to re-examine internships. The idea that the free or the unpaid internship uh, is the way to go. It's, it's okay, I imagine, to offer some of that, but if we're thinking about the last item, which is access, Paid or unpaid inter internship opportunities make a big difference. And if we're talking about students who would love to be engaged uh, on campus, either an on-campus employment position in which they're paid or something that gives them a little bit more flexibility would be ideal. And so I think you knew all this, but I put this in here just as a way to say, if you're, you're thinking about LTE for student success for all students, um, let's not forget the pieces relate, that relate to access, which some might also put in the bucket of equity. But for right now, I think literally access to being able to, to give that to every student. All right, I should have a favorite section, but this is my favorite section just because it relates to data. Uh, I, I promise you all a cheesy analogy. And so strategy number three is to assess needs and processes in addition to outcomes. And I put these two pictures of the flowers up here because I'm trying to develop a green thumb. And what I mean by that is I'm trying to keep a plant alive in my home. And I have had marginal success with this. Now, I know that you might judge me because I told you I grew up on a farm and we have truly grown every type of fruit and vegetable you can think of. But I was working as an understudy to my parents and grandparents. And so I didn't have direct responsibility for the squash and cucumbers. Since that time as an adult, I have had a number of plants and I've chosen the same type. It's a succulent plant. 
my first plant several years ago, uh, pre-pandemic, was named Verde. I'm also trying to learn Spanish, and so I named the plant Verde, in Spanish for green. Uh, Verde uh, has gone on to a better place now, and then I picked up uh, Deuce. Deuce to be my number two plant. Uh, at the end of last year, Deuce also joined Verde in that better place. And now I'm on my third plant named Trey. Okay. As you all can see, they say three points uh, equal a trend. And I'm trying not to have a trend that shows that I cannot keep a plant alive. But I'm using that analogy to say this. Sometimes it's tempting when we're looking at a program or initiative and we say, what's the outcome? How many students are participating? How many of those students that participated have such whatever type of outcome? They're graduating on time or they're making better grades or they're making more friends or they're more connected they're, they're coming to more things on campus we should do that as i mentioned earlier retention persistence graduation we do need outcomes measures but i find that my third strategy of assessing needs and processes are not the ones that i'd like to see elevated uh, that, that people elevate as much i'd like to see more of that and so this is what i mean in terms of the analogy to the plant many could come to my office or to my home and see a plant uh, tray that has green leaves currently does have green leaves uh, and say that you're great you're great with plants and i would probably quickly say thank you so much knowing full well that i had two plants that had gone on um, but the idea is that you would probably assume that because my plant is green i have a great understanding of needs and processes i think those things really do tie in together so for example a succulent plant can't have that much sunlight should not have that much water. If I jump straight into doing the same thing with the plant without acknowledging that it needs to have very little water and very little sunlight, I might not get the outcome that I want. Similarly, I might know that it needs very little water and very little sunlight, but when I do give it sunlight and water, how much? Where should I put it? Where should I position it? How much water is enough? So I use that analogy with regards to our programs and services. If we get to a place where we're looking at outcomes and they're not as ideal as we had hoped, let's not toss the whole program out. It may be that the idea was really good, but maybe our execution of it, our delivery of the program, the day of the week that we offer it, the number of hours that we offer it to, may be in need of a little bit of adjustment. Or perhaps maybe the strategy that we're using is not quite aligned with the specific needs of the student population we're trying to serve. Maybe they don't need to come three times a week. Maybe two times a week would be just fine. Maybe they do need more virtual options and a few less ones in person or vice versa. So I use that to say, uh, Positive outcomes are sometimes the result of tinkering and uh, adjusting and analyzing effectively our needs that we're trying to address and the process by which we address those needs. So long-winded for one single slide, but it's a nice backdrop for where I'm going next in terms of the third strategy. So in the book, I talked to 40 individuals across the country. And this is one of my favorite quotes. This is from Ebony Zamani Gallagher at the University of Illinois. She says, right now, and I think moving forward in the next five years, there will still be a lot of emphasis on big data. There will be more heightened sense of different analytical tools and resources that folks can get access to so they can figure out how to better serve their institutional mission and their students' needs. Whole programs of study are being redesigned. I think some of that redesign is going to be based on how people are looking at needs based on their use of analytics. So that's a lot to say, but if I had to sum it all up, I'd say looking forward in the next five years stands out to me, as well as the idea of whole programs of study being redesigned and figuring out how to better serve the institutional mission. How do you do that? And I can see someone saying, that is a lot, Amelia. Whose responsibility is that? And where do I fit you know, into this? And I would say, that's a good question. And as I thought about that and the purpose of the book, I wanted to create a framework that would be easy to follow, very practical, relatable, that everybody can see themselves in, and use it as a foundation to say, if I have to be a part of this emerging data culture, one that's going to be used to say, to what extent is LTE advancing student success? To what extent are the specific aspects of LTE contributing to student success? And what's my vantage point? How can I add this? I created the data identity framework as a six piece guide to help you see where your strengths are. And so I'm using the analogy of a salad. So in this case, think, think fruit salad, but later on I'm gonna give you the, the, the real salad. So I won't read all of this to you, but I'm making the case that we all have one or more uh, salient pieces of this six, uh, part framework. So we all have a little bit of something. I imagine there are one or two of these boxes on the screen that we do exceptionally well, which would easily make one think, well, if, I, if I'm really great at research and analysis, and I'm really great at strategy and planning, somebody else can do all the communication stuff, somebody else can do all the uh, industry context setting. I'm making the case that we have all six of these things. All of us have some ability in these six areas, and they all advance a little bit more and less depending on where we are in our career and where we're working. And so I didn't call the book, You Are 
a data scientist or a data statistician. I said a data person, the idea that we all have a data identity. And so I'll use a couple of things in here, for example. So research and analysis, of course, you gotta know whether you should use descriptive stats or a regression analysis. Should you use quantitative data or qualitative data? That's good. You should know how to actually do that type of thing. But if you're somebody who just naturally has a knack for communicating very, very clearly, they call you, you can break things down really quickly. You're the person in the meeting who can be the translator that said, what we're really looking for is this or that. That's a skill set because it keeps the, the project moving in the right direction. Similarly, there's always somebody who would say that question. Wouldn't it be nice to know? Wouldn't it be nice to know if people who go to the to the uh, the the dining hall two days a week versus three days a week have better outcomes for showing up to class on time. All types of wonky questions, things that could be interesting to know for sure. But usually there's somebody in a group who says that would be nice to know, but what do we really want to know? If we did have the answer to that question, what would we do with it? That type of thing. So I find that someone who has a skill set related to curiosity and inquiry helps us avoid scope creep. We only have so many people. We only have so many resources to pursue. And so that type of skill set actually pairs really well with the other five. And so Keeping that in mind, I'm making the case that there are several of us who can do many things. Most of us probably spend our majority of our time in some places more than the other, but it doesn't mean that we don't have some of everything. So we're going to have a little bit of more experience, less experience, minor experience. Think of it like a salad. I like this analogy, the idea that if I just had one bowl with nothing but cucumbers in it, let's say that's my research skill. I'm the data person. I'm the one who does nothing but the analysis. Somebody else does communication stuff. A bowl just with cucumbers is fine, but it would be a better salad if it had tomatoes and carrots and green peppers and a lot of other things in it. So when you're building a team and when you're looking at the fullness of your own abilities, I think sprinkling in some campus context, some industry context, some curiosity inquiry, some communication skills, strategy and planning makes for a much robust use of examining needs and processes and outcomes. And so I think it helps us relate better to each other. And to make it more specific, in the framework, I actually have some sub-components. So not to just say uh, six core big bucket areas, I'm sure that was easy to, to hook you into, but each of those has four below that. So for example, I'll, in the area of communication and consultation. So I mentioned earlier that the ability to just translate really well is important, but there's more to it. Being able to know your audience. So what's the right messaging for the LTE conference audience versus the provost office versus student affairs versus students themselves, knowing what the type of delivery you want to do. Should it be a keynote? Should it be a focus group? Should it be a written memo? And then also the ability to follow up can't cover everything in one meeting, what should be the items that you follow up on later on? If there's somebody that you know as a colleague who's just excellent at that, I think that's a subcomponent that's worth highlighting. And so each of the six areas has four. I won't read all these to you. Um, again, if you have more interest in it, we could talk during the chat and question and answer session. Um, but I am making the case that if I say that we all have a combination, here's what I think combinations look like. So let's say you're someone who has a skill in the research and analysis area and you're a great communicator. I think you'd make an excellent curator, someone who can clearly say, here are the issues that we care most about. Here's how we should go about doing it. Here's the relevant literature and data. Similarly, if you're just generally curious, always inquisitive, and you have campus context, you've worked at the University of Connecticut for 10 years, you've seen a lot, I would say you're a great connector. You're someone who could get a conference planning team together and say, I know what the mission is. I know exactly who should be involved in this. And then third, the mission monitor, somebody who's always going to keep us honest. If you're good at strategy and planning, you have campus context, you're the person at the, at the meeting is probably saying, okay, we're making good progress, but are we still on pace with our overall goal? Have we steered off course some? And so there's a combination of two across 15 different pairings. And so I think there's a little something there for everybody. So enough about the book. We got to look ahead. And so we got five more minutes. Or so I want to give some time for questions. What I, what I would say is additional priorities. These are the ones that I, I think if I had more time, twice as much time, I would have added this to the presentation. The first is strategic communication. So uh, UConn is a, a weather delay, you know, and that you can't be together on, on campus. I'm sure that message that came out via email, somebody planned it, somebody drafted it, somebody determined when to send it out, who was going to do it. Every time I've talked to presidents and vice presidents about the most unexpected consideration during the pandemic and even before, they said communication. The cost of effective communication is high. If you're not communicating about pandemic stuff, testing and vaccines and masks, you're communicating whether campus is going to be open or closed. Are you going to be doing certain types of distancing? What time should students be registering for this? How should they be connected to the Wi-Fi? Things like that. If done well in a strategic way, it's smooth. People feel it's, as though they know exactly what's happening. They got the rhythm of the campus. If done frenetically, it creates all types of issues. And so uh, as you're trying to create an LC experience that's good for every student, 
thinking about the modes and methods of communication will be essential. Next, back to that campus policy and advocacy thing, as students are trying to figure out what they want to do with their life, how they want to make an impact on the world. They're gonna be advocating on behalf of themselves and others. And to the extent that campus policy can keep pace with that, we'd be better for it. The third, virtual delivery of programs and services. I think you all know about that. You've done a lot of that over the last uh, several months. And then last, trends and advising. Something about this transformative uh, experience is going to need a guide. Uh, the expense that we have to make to help students navigate transitions and, and find out what matters most to them is going to be huge. So got a few more slides, one for each of these priorities, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. So just set the context. If you were taking, taking notes, maybe don't put this on social media yet. It's a sneak preview that I haven't given to a lot of people. But in about two weeks, there's going to be a new report from NASPA looking at specifically the future of student affairs. And so we surveyed over a, almost 1,000 uh, professionals of different levels of positions and asked them about the future. And one of the things that came out was that 34% said that they are either not at all prepared or only a little prepared to leverage technology to foster community engagement online. And I said, it's a place for some homework. Now, again, what you mean by community engagement online, it could vary. It doesn't mean that we're saying one out of three people doesn't know how to do much of anything. What we're saying, though, is that they're not ready to fully leverage technology to foster the type of rich, engaging community online that they probably could. So I don't mind a little bit of um, uh, work to do, I'd say, going, going ahead. But I think that's going to be important for us in the next two or three years. And it's a consideration we shouldn't forget. Second, thinking about racial justice in higher education. And specifically what we are doing in terms of communication. So I mentioned strategic communication being a huge thing. Um, after the murder of George Floyd, there were a lot of campuses. I'm not sure if UConn was in that group, but that made statements that promised to do things. They said they were going to commit to more training. They were going to invest in more personnel. They're going to continue their overall awareness to not have this issue be something that is kind of uh, shied away from discussing. The students are already you know, ex expecting us to do so. So Right after that period, we took a look, my two colleagues, Alexa and Jill, at over uh, two, 300 different institution statements and looked at them to see what level of description they put in there. What did they commit to? How did they say they were gonna use students involved in that? Who was involved in creating the statement? So what they've created is a bit of a review and an overall content analysis and some areas of discussion for change. So now we're in phase two of the project and that'll probably come out near the beginning part of next year, but we're talking with students and asking them, how do you feel about the promises that your campus has made? Not in a, in an example to, to put the student versus the campus, but to say, where are our gaps? If we're gonna to commit to something that's gonna be more equitable for all students, where do we need to do more work? And so really, proud, really, really proud of this, uh, this project. I think you'd enjoy reading it. It's a, um, a project that we did in collaboration with Natahi, which is the uh, Campus Diversity Officers Association. So a lot in there. I think you, you'll find it to be very interesting, free and available on the campus website, on the NASPA website. And then lastly, if you're still involved in a little bit of virtual support services, if you're still doing some virtual advising or virtual uh, orientation or clubs and activities, things like that, we have been doing an examination of how campuses are delivering what we would call exemplary, as exemplary as possible during the pandemic, delivery of virtual support services. And so I'll give you a simple example from Houston Community College, something that we could totally do at UConn or anywhere else. Uh, during the heightened part of the pandemic, when people couldn't really come to campus like they wanted to, they opened up a virtual meeting room. And let's say all of us were there, you'd have somebody reach out and send you an instant message and say, Amelia, where do you need help? And I say, well, I'm actually, uh, I'm in need of talking to somebody in the advising office. From there, I get put in a breakout room and automatically connected with somebody and it would work. I saved the time of coming to campus. I got specialized support right when I needed it. I did it all from home. And so the biggest question people asked was what technology platform did they use for that? Zoom. They didn't invest in anything new. They totally went with what they already had. And now they have a practice that though they're back on campus, they're trying to see if they can bridge that and keep that going in the, you know, the post-pandemic if we ever get their type phase. So if you want to read more about what these other nine schools did, it's a really cool report. It's at uh, the NASPA website, virtualsuccess.naspa.org. And so the question that came after that was, okay, you told us 10 schools could do it, but how do we do it? And what do they consider? So coming in April will be a guide filled with lots of self-reflection questions, questions to ask yourselves as a team, things that relate to how do you promote experimentation? How do you go about trying new things? How do you really define um, innovation? What does that mean? How do you do it with the eye on risk and compliance and not necessarily being big brother if you want to use data in a more strategic way? So it's filled with lots of discussion of how to do work that's going to prepare us for the future of virtual support services. So a lot there. And then lastly, I would say, 
I mentioned with the comprehensive learner record, as well as um, transitions and helping students through those, that advising would be important. So if you're in a, a phase right now, you kind of you're thinking about how to do advising in a more strategic way, I won't read all these things to you, but I'd say try not to forget about personnel shifts, technology use, integration, and multiple models. Many times someone would say, what's the responsibility of faculty versus student affairs to do advising? Many will say, what's the best technology platform to use? Some will say, we have too many students for each individual advisor. How can we help out? How can we spread that all around? Um, what do we do with prior learning students who are coming with prior experiences and we want to give them credit for that? And then lastly, how do we do that in a way where students feel like regardless of where they're going, their life transformative education experience transcends just one silo. So it happens in the classroom, outside the classroom. How do we pair all that together and make it holistic and integrate it in a way that truly meets the student at a place where they're planning out their biggest goals and dreams? And so I'm at the place where we're landing the plane. We're about to come to a, to a close. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, but I wanna leave you with a few more resources and a couple groups to follow. So two more slides. One, uh, that virtual innovation report that I mentioned. Uh, next, if you're thinking about student identities and you wanna figure out how you can do your direct work with them in a way that affirms those identities and not unintentionally misinterpret things or uh, misconstrue things or even, uh, dare I say, mistreat them. We have a great report called Misunderstanding Your Students, Approaches to Affirming Students' Identities. It's free. Uh, um, I mentioned student development theory earlier in Schlossberg. That's from the standard green book that many in student affairs like to use. But there's a new book by Bonner, Vanda Smith, and, and Marbley that I really like. It's called Square Pegs and Round Holes, an alternative approach to diverse college student development theory. I think you would love it if you read it. Um, if comprehensive learner records interest you at all, this idea that these digital records that are beyond just the transcript are the way of the future, I'd love to tell you more about that. And there's also a report. And then lastly, if advising, if you're on the call and you're really thinking about innovations and in advising, there's a whole advising success network that we lead. We'd be glad to tell you more about that in a partnership of, across five really great national organizations. Speaking of groups, if right now you're thinking, Amelia, you have given us a buffet. There's a lot here. Where do I go next? How do I connect with like minds and things like that? There are really four cool groups that I follow and a part of that I really enjoy, and I think you would too. One is called Credential As You Go. So if we're talking about credentials, how do you capture learning? How do you measure it? How do you make it stackable? Um, this group is comprised of almost every major part of the discussions you can think of. Credentials As You Go, this website is still, still developing. Um, the Today's Students Coalition, they advocate on a lot of, lot of beneficial things for students. So it could be food and uh, housing and security. It could be the cost. It could be doubling Pell. Um, they just keep a lot of good conversation going, a lot of good blog posts. And if you want to know what's happening nationally uh, for student-centered approaches, they're really good. The third is the post-secondary data collaborative for those who are interested in that type of stuff. So I won't go too far into that, but the Institute for Higher Education Policy digs into a lot more details about uh, data stewardship and all things data if you're interested. And if you're not quite at that level, but you do have a little small curiosity about what's happening with data, you can sign up for the Node newsletter. It's brand new, uh, Eric and Eric. So Eric Atchison and Eric Godin, uh, once a week comes to your inbox. It's very easy to read, it's filled with some really cool stuff and a one question survey every week. So I think you would like that. And this is the link to sign up and I'll share the slides. Actually, Nisha already has them, so you get you can do that. And I'll end with this quote uh, from the book. This is Patrick Biddix from the University of Tennessee. And he said, some of the best data you'll ever gather is from conversations with students. A constant source of data for me is conversations with our students, just casual and informal about how their day is going, what their classes are, and what we can do to make things better. And so as I try to think about where I would land the plane and talking about three strategies for embedding LTE for student success for all students and all the things you have on your website, I really do think it always comes back to the student. You know, I know we're going through transitions, us you know, professionally, students individually. I know we're investing in a lot of technology. I know that we have all different types of goals and metrics for student success. But at the end of the day, if we ever want to know how we're doing, I think the best place we can do uh, the best work is to talk with them. And so they'll tell us, they'll be honest with us. And sometimes they'll have questions that are bigger than the ones I introduced in the beginning of the slideshow. But I remain optimistic that we could probably tackle those and most other big questions together. So I'm ready. I promised you to about 10 minutes before. I've got time for questions, if you have any, or reactions, uh, critiques, uh, debates. I welcome all of that. Hopefully not too many debates, but I, I do enjoy a good discussion. So let me stop sharing my screen. I think I can see all of you now. All right, so we got some time. I mean, anything top of mind? Michael, I see you smiling. What's what's top of my mind is that that was amazing. That's that's what's top of my my mind. I'm, there are going to be a lot of questions. I'm quite sure. And sure. we were having a lot of conversations and advising in our in our breakout group and talking about the re, the responsibility of faculty. Mm -hmm. um, you know what we call professional advising. Um, you know, uh, my colleague Aaron Serenvoli and uh, maybe Kelly Kelly Gilbert is here as well. And we're just having a lot of conversations about how do we become a bit more 
um, available to students in that in that space because you know you got 200 advisees. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very difficult. So the resources that you gave us and, and the virtual space that you were talking about not long ago, or just a little bit earlier, are both really interesting to me. And I'm certainly going to go and spend some time and, and check them out. But I think it's just, you know, some people have figured this out, it feels like, yeah. you know what I mean? And so we, we just need to spend a little bit more time out there and see what other folks are doing, because I, I think we can we can move a needle here. That's all. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll say uh, some have figured out some of it. I don't know that I've met a campus that figured it all out. You know, um, I have a, a, a good friend who works at Nakubo. So that's the Business Officers Association. And she likes to say, once you've seen uh, one campus budget, you've seen one campus budget, which basically means no, no two campus budgets are like, once you've seen one advising setup for one campus, you've seen one advising setup for one campus. So I, I wouldn't be too too hard on yourselves that yes, there are definitely some strategies, national approaches and big themes of what works. We know that part there. So if you ever want to talk more about that, we can, but you're not behind. You know, I think that even those who have been highly successful, the pandemic came and leveled the playing field for all of us. <laughs> so I, I would say um, we all have more, more work to do for sure. The, the I don't know if there's a question embedded in it, but I do. I, I would like to add to the um, the point about ratios. And so there's, there's always a big discussion about two things. One, what's the balance of the faculty involvement and the professional advisor? Should it be decentralized and that every student has uh, access across the campus, or should it be professionalized in the sense that there's an advising office and faculty, if they do interact with them, it will be later as they get closer to graduation? Six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. The idea is, I don't know that I have a hard and fast rule to say decentralized or centralized, but there are principles of advising that regardless of which route you choose, or even a hybrid of the two, that you don't forget about. One of which will be the effective use of technology, how to not be creepy and be big brother. How do you actually do it in a way that's holistic? It pairs learning outcomes in the classroom, and outside the classroom. So yeah, I say m many campuses have figured out most of it, um, but I wouldn't say they figured out all of it. And so you're you're in good company. All right, Sarah, uh, is it, does it, oh no, Sarah. Sarah yeah, it's, it's me, I like, I am. Um, so we have been doing a lot of discussion on campus about learning outcomes. Yeah. Um, and I should give it away that uh, I've been, I've been in, heavily involved in that. Um, and I'm the like net liaison. So I'm on the like learning outcome side um, mm -hmm. in the provost office. And I think that there's a lot of folks around who feel like it's just, you know, busy work, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're just adding this on, it's a regulatory thing. And, um, you know, we, I think we are, are really framing it and working towards making sure that people know that, especially for us, I think we want to really bring an equity lens. Yeah. We want to use it to make education more inclusive and, and really work in that space. But I wonder, you know, your work is so rich and it's so accessible. How do you, do you have the like answer ready for the people who say like, outcomes this kind of focus is bringing data in it's just it's just layering it on and what we really need to do is just you know spend the time with the students and, and do that work mm -hmm. you know I'm, I'm just kind of greedy I want both I, I think you got to cover all your bases um I do think I will say this I, I will validate your colleagues feelings uh if it's too much because at some point we could spend forever trying to measure every single outcome and every single sub outcome and where it happens and how it happens such that you never actually get started on the flip side, if we don't ever have any tangible evidence and data, we might find ourselves only speaking in anecdotes. And I don't know that that's going to be good enough to make the case that a, a highly valuable college experience didn't yield what we were hoping that it would. So I think somewhere in the middle is an iterative process. You know, I think that um, you, you would be in good company if you find yourself thinking, where are our campus learning outcomes? Do most, do most divisions know them? Are they consistent across every division? Uh, maybe, you know what I mean? Or do we have our learning outcomes set up by discipline, which is probably more effective, especially in the areas for which students are going to be taking a licensure exam, things like that. But what about the areas for which you don't have licensure? How do you make sense, you know, of all that? So for those who are highly critical of the process of continuing to examine learning outcomes, I would say we need that because if for nothing else, it's a value proposition. Students are coming to us asking us, what can I learn from being here? And to the extent that we can make that clear and transparent for them, that is enough. And I would say um, helping them be involved in it such that when they are showing not a resume, but instead an e-portfolio or something that that displays that they know a lot of things, can do a lot of things, they need a frame from which to do that and they need it to be consistent. So if for no other reason, making sure we're kind of aligned on learning outcomes makes it so that not every student has a different experience. And so if we like, well, just make it up on the fly, I might be the person who just got lucky and I happen to be working with Aaron. And so my understanding of learning outcomes is especially strong. But if my colleague Joe happens to not be with Aaron, maybe someone says, well, just make it up on the fly. 
that doesn't seem to be equitable to me. You know, you want to have something that's consistent, not so restrictive and prescriptive that you can't have flexibility. But um, I would say you need you need some measurement of learning outcomes. You need quite a bit of learning measurement uh, when it comes to helping students marry what they can do. But I would caution us to not necessarily spend so much time there that we don't actually explore putting it into practice. So um, there are a couple different institutes. I think AAC and U has one that's really good. Um, it's a general education and assessment conference where they talk about how to uh, reimagine your learning outcomes, how to make them more practical, make them consistent. Um, I think NILOA has some really great resources in terms of how to measure learning. So once you do set up your learning outcomes, what's the right balance of how far to go with measurement and how often should you do it? And what are the right strategies to do that in a way that doesn't end up becoming overly burdensome or cumbersome to people? It's like, oh my goodness, if I have one more learning outcomes conversation. But instead, how might I embed learning outcomes in everything that we can do? So um, some of it is part strategy, but your question is a good one. I, I'm not sure. Did I answer or was there part two to it? No, I think that's a okay. great answer. Yeah. And we can talk more if you want, um, especially if you're looking for something more tangible, I would say. There are some really good frameworks that are out there. Some of them could be specific to the academic coursework, but others also for the outside the classroom. Just let me know. Yeah, I may take you up on that. But and, right. and I think, uh, and I'll just throw this out, and I, I don't know, you know, there's others I know in this conversation. Some of it is not even the excellent frameworks and resources that we can bring in it's like how do you get people to the point that they're like i'm i'm ready oh <laughs> yeah oh you, well, you, you want to see a bunch of people leave the the virtual chat if i say and next we're going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about data and i wish people would stay and they're like you lost me so like, you know, this it's truly it's relational you know it's, it, there's there's no harm in that i, I understand why we got to you know we got to have a different reframe I, I love conversations about learning outcomes and data but sometimes you know, we just haven't made it as interesting and appealing, uh, but it's an opportunity there. I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not too, too hurt by that. So people come by it honest. What else? Folks, don't wait for us. Just please unmute and, and, and jump in. Let's just oh, have yeah. a conversation. Yeah, let's just, let's just be open. Or put it in the chat, put it in the chat. Put it in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll I'll jump in. It's Sandy Bushmick. Um, we I'm part of the advising mentoring subcommittee for LTE at UConn, yeah. and um, you know we struggled. We started out with advising and mentoring, and then we realized how much mentoring. Uh, and I was zipping in and out of your talk, so forgive me if I miss something. But how much okay. um, mentoring? There's so much mentoring that's so critically important to the students' uh, self-worth and outcome and what they do. And then there's advising and sometimes they get really mixed up and we have both staff-centric advising and faculty-centric advising in our university. Mm -hmm. So I just would like to hear your thoughts on that, please. You know, I think it has to, of course, you know, the decision centralized, decentralized, I'm happy to hear that you've tried both. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to, to choose one or the other. And, and again, it ebbs and flows. I think that the intersection of mentoring and advising, when the lines become blurred, I can see how the symptoms of that show up, which is to say, is the purpose of mentoring to truly deal with the more relational aspects of college and say, how do I deal with changing a major, things like that? And should advising be something that moves us beyond just meeting to check off classes that, that students have taken and checking on the program study, but instead advising them on how to choose a career and choose one that that actually builds on their skill set. So I could see how the relational aspect of mentoring doesn't have to be exclusively relational and might tip over into formal advice. Similarly, I could see someone saying, well, you know, Sandy, you're my advisor. You know, I've met with you for the last two semesters. Can you just give me some advice on this other thing too, which doesn't quite fit into the advising. To make it even more broad, I think now the, the trend, which is not really so much a trend anymore, is that we used to say academic advising. And it was specific, which is say, when you meet with your advisor, you're going to talk about your classwork and progress toward a credential. It then started to bleed into financial advising, career advising, health and well-being, things that just are kind of on the bucket of advice. And so what I would say here is that if you find that that rhythm of blending is working in a way where students feel like there's no path that won't lead to them getting reliable and trusted kind of counsel, then I think it's kind of okay. But if it turns into something where you're like, you know, hey, we have a segment of colleagues who truly don't feel like they're 
positioned to do this well. And then there are some who would say they need more help because they are positioned well, but they can't be cloned. That's where I would say tinker a little bit with your strategy. And it might truly be an aspect of communication to say, what do we have the most capacity to do and where are our gaps? And so if, I, if I'm, you know, going with what I see as trends, oftentimes there are certainly more students who need the more traditional academic advising than we have individuals who have that preparation that can tell them specifically about how to choose a course major. The more relational mentoring piece, that's there too, but you want to make sure that you know those who are doing that have capacity to do that, are aware of things that probably would end up being tripwires and things of that sort. So my first reaction is you're in good company, as you probably guess I would say that. Second, I would say take a little bit of an assessment of the process through which students flow into and out of um, mentoring and advising. So if, the, if you truly see them as a little bit different, how did they get there? How did they land there? If you find that you have um, colleagues who are coming back and saying, ah, I don't know if I can manage this, this blend. I'm not really sure about role clarity. I would start back with the student's journey. Did they get there through a regular meeting with the faculty member who then referred them to somebody else? Or did they start off in a traditional advising office? And that was like, well, I'm not really sure. Go to this person, that person. If we can't navigate it that smoothly, then I think that's probably an indication that we might need to put a little bit more structure, not necessarily silos, but a little bit more flow and process management. And I think that might help a little bit with the shepherding people to the right um, place at the right time. Uh oh, you're on mute. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. It's noisy here. <laughs> um, um, I, th I think that's very helpful, actually, because uh, we're thinking about trying to define our own definitions are muddied. Mm -hmm. And so the students don't really know right. exactly where to go. And we have, we have many sources of really quality, um, uh, informal mm -hmm. mentoring, you know, people that do a lot of great work, you know, that, you know, Anyway, so yeah. that's helpful to define where they're coming from, to actually look from from where they come and then back it up that way. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll do that. Yes, All right. Thank, you. thank cool. you so much. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Do the professor thing of like giving Come everyone on a few minutes, right? I know there's questions out there. Is you know, I, I struggle with it as well. You know, I like to pack a lot into the time. So if it's been like five seconds, it's like, well, if there are no more thoughts, you know, that when in fact someone is probably in the middle of typing something or thinking thinking about something. I, I've been thinking a lot about this uh, transition piece that you've been talking about, because we have a lot of students at UConn that beyond going beyond your, what you'd call your typical transition to college, we have, I mean, the pandemic's another thing altogether, but we have regional campus students who transition to our main campus. Mm -hmm. We have regional campus students who are living on our main campus and going back and forth. And um, there's a handful of people, you know, across the board who have been trying to address this for years because it's a really hard transition and the data is not good. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it could be the qualitative data like you quoted from your in, in your last bit of your slide where they're just talking to students and hearing about their transitions, but also thinking about um, the data on student outcomes. And so I think my question is more about the advocacy piece when you come to data and when you have a lot of people all across the board who are doing the best they can to support students through this transition during during what's already, you know, an overtaxed time. Mm -hmm. But then we have the data and we want to take it to people who can do something with it. Yeah. Even if we, you know, for some of us, the writing is on the wall. And so how can we advocate from our various different positions of everyone in the room to make this a better process for students? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think some of it is going to have to be uh, addressing that, that. I hate to put it like this, but it, it reminds me a little bit of your question is a little bit of the intersection of advocacy and data. Uh, so, so advocacy, but the 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 resource that you need to make your advocacy points stronger. And oftentimes I find it to be a little relational. And um, there are a couple symptoms that I would say show up when you're trying to do that and you're not seeing movement. So for example, let's say uh, you and I have a little debrief after this and we talk and we say, it's pretty obvious the data are clear that we need to do the following three things in order to advance and make these choices. Unfortunately, uh, there are a couple symptoms, one of which is denial. So that when you come and you say, I think we know exactly where three critical tweaks might help us, there's going to be that person who comes with their supplemental data, not to be combative or contentious, but to say, I don't really see it that way. Uh, I, I was talking to a student last week and they told me that they didn't have that experience. So assuming you can get over the hurdle of the denial, that's probably not this campus, probably not this scenario. You might get to competition, which is to say, we have these three things that we feel like we want to make moving on. They could probably advocate, uh, we could do the best advocate for changes. Well, 
that looks very similar to something we were already doing. And let's just let this play out a little bit longer. And if that doesn't yield the kind of results we do, then we'll come back to these other three things. As though the two things couldn't coexist, but it's never, it doesn't need to be a zero sum game, but that's, that's the case. And then the third is truly something people don't like to acknowledge, which is that there are gonna be key decision makers in certain places for which you have to actually engage. And so I, I, I struggle to continue to adequately capture the need for a great relationship between student affairs and academic affairs. And they're not the only ones. IT and IR, if you want to see that relationship, campuses that move the best and most swiftly, IT and IR have a great connection where sharing and being honest about what you need is there. Same thing for academic affairs and student affairs. So in this case, I would say if you've crossed the hurdle of making sure that you're, you're maybe succinct number of things, three stands out to me, but your three key levers, three things, three, three data points um, are, are set. If you can make the case that for the broad swath of students, and, and I would chop that up by uh, many different variables. So not just for your residential students, but students who are coming as transfers, students who are adults, um, who are over 25, those are parents. If those three, whatever tweaks, three data points, whatever hold true for those, I think you got something. And sometimes it takes a steady drumbeat. It takes a steady, consistent messaging across a number of colleagues. And the hook for me is probably going to be, uh, we are doing work, both of us, wherever the other person's uh, line is, that contributes to student success. And LT is a commitment for the whole campus. Let me show you how you can contribute to this, if you are so inclined. If there's no competition there, if there's no denial there, the door should be relatively open. I think it takes time. Uh, I would picture it to say nothing happens overnight. Um, but if it hasn't gotten to that point, I think maybe those two detractors might be part of the way there. Third, when I was saying in the, the, the data identity framework that communication and consultation is key, this is where that lies, which is to say, you, you, it just takes refinement. You know I mean? The same message for, for every audience is not gonna work. So being able to get to know your colleagues and what interests them most, not to put a spin and not to manipulate, but truly to say, why would somebody in, uh, the orientation office care about this? Why would somebody in parking care for this? Why would somebody in conduct care about this? You have to be able to tailor it to them. Same three premise, you know, uh, approach, but just a different, different strategy. Erin, I hear this question a lot. If you ever want to talk more specifically, aparnell at nasta.org. I enjoy these types of discussions. Uh, I really do. Um, Kay, I think I saw you go off mute. You Did you go off mute? That's going to be odd if you didn't. Yes, I am. I did. Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for for being here and uh, sharing a great presentation with us, not only in terms of information, but also how you delivered this. Uh, this is much appreciated from my side. I wanted to um, ask a question to you. Um, so you have shown a lot of information and you have broken this down into, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer, by the way, civil engineering. And you have broken that down to uh, several categories, what some could do, what is what might be a good strategy, a strategy to follow up with, or what is recommended to improve certain things. And over the course of your presentation, these are all things, but, but they add up and they could be 10, 20, 50 things, right? And, and if you're really into this, how to improve things. Now, rolling this all backwards, um, if you, like look at your own virtues when you improve something then you might fear from inside out that those things what you have mentioned automatically might make sense to follow up with because then you're like you feel this way you are you're motivated in this way and so you, you might not be worried about oh i i, I should uh, follow those advice because they're good ones because you feel like those are the right things to do and i want to do that so my question to you is what was one virtue what worked for you to work on to um which helped you like seeing those things and improving the learning yeah. environment that it advised us on thanks mm -hmm. you know honestly uh i like that you mentioned that you're an engineer and i imagine um i don't have great experience in engineering or, or what engineers do but i imagine that all, all oftentimes relates to how things work how they fit together um and how do you go from one place to the next so i like the way you frame the question. If I had to boil it all down to say a starting point for me that I always start from any talk, it truly is going to be the virtue related to what I mentioned about the podcast. And that was that I said that if anybody who is trying to navigate a new experience has some clear opportunity to learn and have access to what they need. 
a lot of what I put in the slides related to advising, related to virtual support services, related to um, campus uh, advocacy, things like that, it all starts back to the root question of a student showing up to a campus and saying, I need help in this area, how can I get there? Building around it all the systems, all the pathways, all the different types of collaborations, connections, what are the skill sets that we need to make this work, it all ties back to one singular check. If we do all that stuff well, the student who says, how do I get the help that I need to navigate college should be relatively simple. The hard part is that every student should be able to say that. And as long as we still have students who cannot say that they can do that, then we still got more work to do. So we tinker with our data policy, we tinker with our research, we tinker with our practice. And so it looks different for every campus, but I think some of the same symptoms show up quite a bit. So if students say, I, I can't really navigate this thing because I talked to my advisor and I got one question answered this way, talked to a professor, I got another question answered that way. Or I ended up trying to connect on the Wi-Fi for this class that I'm trying to join and the connection broke, something like that. So. Long answer to your question, the virtue that I hold true is usually back to the very, very beginning, which is that if a student is on the campus in person virtually, however, and their key question is, I need help with this. Do we have the systems in place to support them? Are those systems fluid enough, flexible enough, collaborative enough, innovative enough to get there? Chances are you can't do everything on the list all at the same time. So there's a constant iteration of tweaks and checks and balances. But if we do that, I think the likelihood of having fewer students um, answer that question as no, I don't know exactly where to go, should continue to be lower and lower, which feels like success kind of to me. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. This. That was cool. I have a question. Um, you know, we, hi, Ray, we, we're really good at telling stories. I mean, especially with the students and being able to relay their stories and, and things. Um, where do we start if we want to incorporate as part of that storytelling culture, a more data-centric approach to the narrative? Mm -hmm. I think you got to go honestly with context. Um, a data centered approach sometimes makes people nervous. And just the word data, honestly, makes people immediately think quantitative, like, oh, well, at the very least, I, I, I used to use Qualtrics. I know how to create a survey. And that's good. Survey data is good. One level up, well, I just need to get access to the student information system. I'll pull some data from there or the learning management system. And all of that is really, really good. The more deep you get into the conversation, though, the more you lose people along the way. And it's for a variety of reasons. Somebody would say, well, I don't have access to that data to compare with you. Or I have data, but it's not the same data that you have. Or I haven't taken a stats class in a while. I don't have time to learn about it. Or I don't have time to collect my own data, that type of thing. So I find that you need to have the balance for sure. You need to have a data-informed climate and culture. But I actually think the starting point is context. Is, is campus context is more than anything um, understanding the rhythm. When I say rhythm, what's going on? You know, to some to some degree, um, you're right. We do tell a lot of stories, and a lot of it is anecdotal. I went to a really great LCE conference for the University of Connecticut, and that's all of you. And I could easily go to another another group of people and say Connecticut's doing some really great things. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if I was the only person who was there, who else could talk about the really great things that were there? You know what I mean? Only I. Now, it's true. You all are doing really great things. But at some point, I need to pair that Connecticut is doing some really great things with some data, with a little bit of example, a link to your website, some, some evidence, so to speak. I think we can go too far, though, jumping straight to the evidence that we lose the, the momentum, get some people in a little bit and say, tell me about your experience. So what was it about the LTE uh, conference that was so special? I said, well, they actually talked about this, 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 and this. Let me show you the program. A little bit at a time, I think the anecdotal stories turn into themes from focus groups. The themes from focus groups then turn into enough questions for a survey. The questions from the survey then turn into longitudinal analysis of the data in the student information system. So it's almost like building blocks, so to speak. But I find that quickly, if we jump straight from that one single person in one breakout group that said, you know what we need to look at? The number of transfer students who are majoring in history that came from 50 miles away. It's like, my goodness, how did you get to that very narrow question? Because I was just talking to a student who was a transfer student 50 miles away, and they had a terrible experience. So if we fix that, we fixed everything, which is to say, okay, maybe let's, <laughs> let's not do that. <laughs> let's, let's go a little bit broader. So all that to say is, Daryl, I have a great respect and appreciation for the story. I think you don't need exclusively data on a spreadsheet. They have to be paired with a really great set of qualitative data. But at the same time, I would say, let's take our time with it, slowly build it, bring more people into the discussion first. Each of them have their own sets of anecdotes. Each of them have their own sets of, uh, of stories to tell. Let it build and grow over time such that the culture and climate is one that when people hear the word data, they're not like, oh, I'm either about to have to defend my program or bring something that shows that it's working. But instead to say, 
Yeah, actually, I do have some data that I would, I would like to, to, to share here. I have a couple student stories, but I also have a couple survey results here. And I have a couple early things I've been doing, tinkering with the LMS, and I found some stuff. So take that, multiply it by, you know, 10, 15 people, and now you got something. But a slow building data culture just truly takes time. And there are a lot of detractors from that. Again, the denial thing, the competition thing, the politics thing. So when conversations break down and people don't want to engage, it's, it's really not the result of ill will. I think so much of it is just not having a blueprint of how these conversations can actually be cool. I've managed to, to sprinkle in data all through our conversation today. And I mean, most people are still seem to be joined relatively, you know, so I feel like I, I have a good impression. <laughs> it could, it can happen. We got to do it more often to make people want to come back again though. But um. Yeah, that's a good question. Did I answer your question though? Cool. Program assessment, we got something here. Uh, all right, looks like this is from Emma. For program assessment, what emphasis should be put on summative assessments versus formative assessments? Now, it's a very good one. Courses seem to be tied to learning goals and we need to show how they're mapped throughout the curriculum. Is it important to have a capstone course with an exit or an exit exam with questions that can provide evidence of learning they're met? How can experiences like internships at curriculum? Got all that. Um, both and I, that's the easiest one for me what I, and what i would say here is if you're if you're solely relying on one or the other um i know why and if you're thinking about the course and to say well if they've spent 15 weeks with us they should be able to take a comprehensive exam and show us what they can do at the same time though let's say uh to daryl and michael and uh, Kay and I have all been listening to the same lecture series once a month for the last you know, semester, we might have some learning outcomes there too. And maybe we, we're not able to actually take an examination, but we're able to do a self-reflection, something like that. So um, I think you need both. I think the goal though, is that whatever assessment that you've used, that you've determined through some level of validation, that it does capture some learning. I think the nuance here is whether you want to go depth of learning. So if you're saying uh, the learning was just at exposure level to say, okay, we sat in on some webinars and some lectures for every other month for a semester, I probably would say that's more exposure to say I've been exposed to something. I've learned a little bit, but my depth of knowledge is not quite there. I'd say the next middle ground is probably going to be your more integrated, like picking up some stuff. And then the third would be truly transformational to say, hey, you've been immersed in a weekly class multiple times per week. And that's where I think your capstone type stuff should ex explore that type of thing. Not suggesting that a co-curricular experience can't be at that level of transformation. It just takes more work. It takes more duration and more intentionality around it. So I say both and, but I think I would focus less on the either or of should it be formative or summative, summative but instead the, the depth of the learning that you're hoping to yield from the experience. And I think there's enough room for probably all of that to some degree. UConn, yes, if you would like to go to a conference of learning record, uh, I can tell you a lot about that. Um, communicating the value proposition. Uh, yes, so what I found most often is that if you create the record first and then say, here students, we have a great record for you, would you like to use it? Chances are they're gonna say, if I have time to, I guess it's, I guess it's okay. Um, the communicating the value part though will actually work. Many of the students I think um, that campuses are trying to reach with this are not just exclusively like the students who are highly engaged or in student government. They're really looking to reach most students who are already doing some stuff. So maybe they might have an on-campus job or they might have be in the middle of an internship or they might actually be doing a practicum in some area or they might be doing none of that, but instead just happen to be in a class where they're learning something really, really great about black history they want to share. The, the value proposition for the student is that if they have any aspirations for advancing into an internship or any aspirations for going to graduate school or any aspirations in general to say, I want to make my college experience, the narrative about it be more um, depth, you know, have more depth there, the conference of learning record can do that. And I think it's really more of an advising tool, less of a just traditional record. Like, I don't know that they need another login to show somebody something, but instead, when someone asks them, tell me what was so special about your UConn experience, coaching them through the process of telling their own story, that's a value proposition, because they've been asked several times over, like, how's college going? What you learning? Then they would say, well, let me show you. So I think you probably come out best starting, starting with a little bit of a prototype set of questions, asking students, what do you hope to gain most and learn most, and then start from there, build it build it out that way. But um, I've learned a lot from a lot of schools around that communication. What's the right time to, to do it? Do you create it first and then hand it, hand it over to students? Or do you have students involved in the co-development of it? I think it's somewhere in the middle. But if you think you might move in that direction, I definitely have some resources to, uh, to show you how campuses have done it and some, some people I can connect you to um, that you might enjoy talking with. <laughs> You're welcome, Caroline. I think on that note, we may like wrap it up. I'm gonna invite everyone to unmute for a minute and uh, like do a proper round of applause because this was amazing. Hey. So.
you know, hear me clap. Yeah. If we were together, this would be the time I'd be clapping and, and uh, waving yeah. to y'all. It's always a little strange in the, the virtual platform. Um, feel free if you want to hang out, join a group. You're very welcome. If you want to go uh, get on with your day, also, uh, uh, we have loved having you here. Um, for those um, hanging out and uh, for our continued breakouts, what's going to happen now is we're going to assign the breakouts. Excuse my uh, first grader on her snow day <laughs> who's assisting me. Um, uh, we are going to assign the breakouts. Everyone can kind of dip and take a, a couple of minutes, um, take a quick bio break, grab your coffee, whatever you need to do. And then um, we'll go into those groups. Um, each one will have a facilitator to help you there too. We can have a few minutes, reflect on things we took out of Dr. Parnell's talk, and then also come back to those goals from the morning and start to think about like, how could we turn them into outcomes? How might we measure that work and think about how we could know, like, is that happening? Is there a baseline to get to? Like start digging into to those questions and, and put them together into the, the topic areas. So. Thank you so much for joining us today. This was amazing. You are welcome. Thank you for the kind invitation. It, it matched everything I said in the beginning. I, I, my favorite part is actually getting to talk with you all. So thank you for the, the time. It was, it was fun. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I put my email address in the, in the chat. So um, don't be a stranger. But in the meantime, I hope you all stay warm and enjoy the weekend. All right. I'll see you later. Bye-bye. Thanks.